Coming up, a broken neck. She'll be paralyzed from the chest down and will never walk again. From a 17-foot fall. I was never going to be in control of my life again. Their desperate plea. Like, please give me something. Please give Liz something. And divine response. So there's no way that you couldn't believe that that's a miracle. Our week of prayer continues on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks. They say Hail Mary is good if you're down the last uh, uh, down on a football game and you throw that long pass and hope somebody catches it. Well, it looks like um, uh, Senator Cruz thinks that uh, Hail Mary is going to do some good for him. I doubt it sincerely. But he has chosen a very intelligent, attractive lady, Carly Fiorina, as his running mate. But he hadn't got anything to run on yet. So... What is she going to be the mate to? We don't know. Terry. Well, meanwhile, Trump is laying out his vision for what he would do as president in the area of foreign policy. Dale Hurd has the story. My friend and the next vice president of the United States, Carly Fiorina. It's an unusual move for a presidential candidate to pick a vice presidential running mate before winning his party's nomination. Even more unusual when his path to the nomination is blocked. But trailing Donald Trump, Ted Cruz went ahead and announced his choice. I am prepared to stand by his side and give this everything I have. Carly Fiorina tussled with Trump early in the primary season for comments he made about her face. And the GOP frontrunner dismissed this latest move. A new relationship has started. Cruz and Carly. Cruz can't win. What's he doing picking vice presidents? Trump had other things to talk about as well. He gave a major foreign policy speech in Washington and warned America's allies they'll need to start paying for their own defense. He also railed on the Bush genocide. and Obama administrations for not stopping the persecution of Christians in the Middle East. We have done nothing to help the Christians. Nothing. And we should always be ashamed for that, for that lack of action. Trump went from there to Indiana, where he got the endorsement of legendary Indiana Hoosiers basketball coach Bobby Knight ahead of Tuesday's primary. If we win Indiana, it's over. I'm not playing games with Indiana. After Indiana votes, Hillary Clinton is hoping it's all over for Bernie Sanders. Delegate math is not with Sanders, who rallied thousands of screaming fans at Indiana University hours after he announced the layoffs of hundreds of campaign staffers. Next Tuesday, let us have the highest voter turnout in Indiana history. Ted Cruz is 400 delegates behind Trump. And while he expects to win Indiana, if he doesn't, analysts say it's all over. Dale Hurd, CBN News. You know, I was watching uh, Krauthammer, uh, who just dumped on uh, Cruz, I mean, on Trump's foreign policy speech. Barry McCaffrey, former four-star general, said it was a home run, hit it out of the park. Uh, I think uh, other uh, foreign policy experts have applauded it. I personally read the thing. I thought he did a, a very good job. I mean, it's only, you only say so much in a speech, and it takes 20, 25 minutes. I mean, you can't outline a book on foreign policy. But what he's saying it touches the heart of a lot of Americans. He said, look, we've been kicked around. We've been abused. They've taken advantage of us. When you look at NATO, only two nations, are on, I think, to uh, give 2% uh, of their GDP toward military. The rest of them uh, aren't carrying their load, and it's true. For, World War II ended a long time ago, 1945, and we've still got substantial troops in Germany. Germany is a big power. Why should we pay the bill for that? And that's what Trump is saying. Same thing in Korea. We've got a huge contingent in Korea. Korea, uh, South Korea is a huge nation, has vibrant industry, very prosperous. Why should we pick up the tab for defending them against the North? And uh, that doesn't mean we pull back from international commitments, but it does mean we've got to ask them to pay the bills. And that's what Trump is saying. We've been like Uncle Sucker. And uh, so I think a lot of Americans are saying, yes, Donald, you're saying it right. And uh, 
And this, I think, will help propel him along the way. But um, it's only a little bit more to go. Indiana could be a, a real turning point. Cruz, uh, if he loses Indiana, he's finished. And uh, Trump may just go ahead and say, all right, I'm, I'm it. He's already declared himself the presumptive nominee. And uh, th there's still a lot of uh, negotiating back and forth. But I do think that his vice president is sitting there in Ohio. I mean, uh, John Kasich hasn't won anything for president. And I understand the rules are such that he now cannot qualify to be the nominee for president. But he certainly would make a fantastic vice president and bring a lot of weight to the Tempe ticket. But that's, that's up to Donald Trump to decide. Well, in other news, it looks as if the Supreme Court is going to side with former Virginia Governor Bob McDonald against the federal government. The justice wanted to know if federal prosecuted went too, prosecutors went too far in their charges against the sitting governor. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Thanks, Pat. The justices had tough questions for the government about McDonald's conviction on corruption charges under federal law. The case could have implications for elected officials across the country. The justices wanted to know if government prosecutors could use a vague law to charge a politician with a crime, even if he or she wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary. Jennifer Wishon was inside the courtroom during oral arguments and brings us the story. It looked like a very good day in the nation's highest court for Bob McDonald. The former Virginia governor is facing two years in prison after being convicted of political corruption. But justices seem poised to overturn his conviction. Never during any time in my 38 years of public service uh, have I ever done anything uh, that would abuse the powers of my office. At issue is a federal law that forbids public officials from accepting money in exchange for official acts. The question is, what qualifies as an official act? In court, justices grappled with where to draw the line between corruption, giving away favors in return for gifts, and ordinary public service. Justices on both sides of the ideological divide seemed troubled by the nearly unbridled power federal prosecutors have to go after elected officials who are working to help the constituents who hired them. Justice Stephen Breyer, generally considered a liberal, was the most outspoken, saying the law used to convict McDonnell puts at risk behavior that is common. The government charged McDonnell with giving out favors in return for gifts, but lawyers for the former governor say he never gave anything back after receiving gifts from a businessman. A number of unlikely groups filed friend of the court briefs on McDonnell's behalf, including dozens of former White House attorneys for both Republican and Democratic presidents, including President Obama. Chief Justice Roberts remarked, I think it's extraordinary that those people agree on anything. It's been a three-year nightmare for the McDonald family. Throughout the process, the former governor has relied on his Catholic uh, and, faith. Uh, I want to give uh, credit to, to my Lord Jesus uh, for his uh, sustaining me and my wife and my family during these last uh, 39 months that have been very, very difficult. He and his wife, Maureen, who also faces prison time, have tried to maintain some level of normalcy while they await the rulings on their cases. Governor McDonald even volunteers for Operation Blessing. Got uh, two grandchildren and two more on the way and uh, started a new business. And, uh, you know, I've got the most amazing friends in the world and felt more love and support in the last two years than any time in my life. So I'm a very blessed man. Along with his Christian faith, McDonald, an attorney himself, has always expressed faith in the law. I've given my life to public service in 38 years and have loved every minute of it. And. Um, this has obviously been a personal challenge, but whoa, whoa, whoa. On, I know guys, the justice guys. system will get this right. The court is expected to issue its ruling in June. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the Supreme Court. Thanks, Jennifer. Pat, do you agree with Governor McDonald that uh, the justice system is going to get it right on this one? Uh, well, you'd hope so. In this case, I think it's going to be the case. <clears throat> the Supreme Court, uh, you know, if uh, Scalia had been still on the court, it would have been a so-called slam dunk. I mean, it would probably been five to two uh, or six to two, seven to two, whatever, uh, in favor of McDonald. But it looks like with Breyer and others on the court, because the friends of the court, the so-called Misi or Mikas briefs that were filed, go across the broad spectrum of uh, attorneys general, both Democrat, both Republican guys like Lanny Davis, who was a White House counsel for Clinton, um, and uh, uh, 
professors from Harvard, all say, here's the, here's the situation, ladies and gentlemen. We have in Virginia very liberal laws. There is no crime whatsoever in an official receiving gifts, none whatsoever, as long as he declares the gifts. So if he got a million dollars from somebody, he, he, he's a gift. Okay. Now, the question is, did the man buy something for that gift? And if in turn, the governor or the official then sits down and says, okay, I now give you uh, water rights over the Chesapeake Bay in exchange for your gift, that is a so-called quid pro quo, and that is illegal. That is corruption. Now, came up with Bob McDonald. A man says, well, you, why don't you ride in my Ferrari? Big deal. Why don't you stay at my uh, hunting lodge in the mountains? Big deal. It happens all the time. Would you have uh, host a meeting in the uh, governor's mansion for some supporters of my company? All the time public officials do that because their job is to promote business from their constituents and to bring business to the state and to offer friends favorable situations for those doing business as their constituents. That's what they do. It's when they start the, you know, it's quid pro quo. You get the quid, but you don't give the quo. Bob McDonald gave that Johnny, whatever he's doing, millions, nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing. And so the Hobbs Act, the, the, the judge who ruled on this ruled incorrectly. He gave a charge the jury was highly slanted. And the Justice Department was trying to get somebody who was a potential uh, senatorial candidate. Bob would have won a Senate seat, not to mention being mentioned as a potential vice presidential. And so this was politics. And the Supreme Court, God bless them, is coming out right. And, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts is asking the Justice Department, all right, tell us who you can uh, prosecute. What acts would they have to do? Well, they can do almost anything. I mean, they could send out newsletters in favor of a company, and that could be in violation of the Hobbs Act. Well, it's too vague. And under our law, you do not put somebody in jail on a law that is so vague they can't understand what they're doing. And that's what Justice Breyer was talking about. This is unconstitutionally vague. After all these years, when I keep reminding my dear friend Bob McDonald about what happened to Joseph, when it was all over and he came out of prison, he wound up running Egypt. So I don't know if John is in the cards for Bob, but he's going to be a stronger man, a dedicated Christian, and a great public service servant. He's one of the best governors we've ever had in Virginia, and this thing is a disgrace. So thank God. And we're finding people from CNN and others who heard of the justices and realized where that case is going. And so keep praying for, for Bob, the decision. Actually, they vote right after the oral argument. And, and then they decide who's going to write the, the, the decision. And the chief will decide which member of the, of the Supreme Court will write the decision. And we'll have a decision sometime, well, I think. The in support June. he's had from his own peers is, what? The support he's had from his own peers is remarkable. He I mean. had business leaders. He had educational leaders. He had all kinds of distinguished lawyers uh, on both sides of the, yeah, you see, guys like Lanny yeah. Davis and others said, look, this is a misapplication of law. If, if, you, if this Hobbs Act is supposed to be interpreted this way, then it is unconstitutional. And that's what the justices are saying. So anyhow. Can I say also, that's the kind of political junk that people are sick of. They are. You know, they really just, are. They don't want crooked politicians. But here's an honest man who's being yes, pilloried because he family. was a potential candidate. He would have won the Senate race if he'd run. No question he would have won it. And there's no question he would have been a, a vice president for Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> they went out to get him. And th this is a dirty game, but the man is... He's gone to his knees. He's cried out to God. He's, he's um, uh, exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, and God's going to honor him. So anyhow, whew, wow, what a, t what a story. Well, John, what's next? Pat, after the recent earthquakes along the Ring of Fire in Ecuador and Japan, some people have raised questions about possible natural disasters right here in the U.S. The biggest one could come from Yellowstone National Park because it sits on top of the world's largest volcano. Back in 2011, Paul Strand visited Yellowstone and filed this report about just how devastating an eruption there would be. 
Recent news stories warn Yellowstone is on the move. Since 2004, the ground has been expanding upwards at an accelerated pace, sometimes as much as three inches a year. We have significant ground movement over tens of square miles. That accelerated expanding has some folks worrying because Yellowstone is basically a slowly ticking time bomb. One that might take hundreds of thousands of years to blow, but blow it will. Because Yellowstone is the world's largest megavolcano, 53 miles across, and it's produced three of the planet's most monstrous eruptions. Hollywood and the Doomsday Flick 2012 imagine what it will look like if or when it happens again, with the main character racing, running, and flying away from the super hot pyroclastic clouds that would burn anyone to the bones caught in their blast. He couldn't really have raced, run, or flew fast enough to get away. All of Yellowstone's natural beauty, any wildlife that hadn't fled, any humans unfortunate enough to be within dozens of miles would be annihilated. Ash clouds would spread across much of the U.S. A Geological Society of London report states so much sulfuric acid would be created in the atmosphere, it would block sunlight and plunge Earth temperatures anywhere from 9 to 15 degrees for years. As the report puts it, such events could result in the ruin of world agriculture, severe disruption of food supplies, and mass starvation. The effects could be sufficiently severe to threaten the fabric of civilization. And that's what could lead to possibly a billion casualties. Half of the world's geysers are right here in Yellowstone, the result of water superheated by a huge magma chamber four to six miles below the surface, America's hottest hot spot. It's what would cause the next mega explosion. And that threat is what keeps scientists locking GPS monitors on the park surface 24 hours a day, and why they know the center of Yellowstone is rising about two inches every year. If we were getting about a yard per year, we'd get real excited. Because dramatic ground swelling can signal magmas on the way up, ready to cause a rerun of history's most destructive mega eruption. Here's some of Yellowstone's lava up close, but looking into the distance, imagine the awesome and horrifying sight is that massive caldera that stretches out for dozens of miles erupted in the largest explosion in all of Earth's history. It left a crater, also known as a caldera, so many miles across you could drop Tokyo right in the middle and have room left over. Yellowstone geologist Hank Hessler says that mega explosion blasted 600 cubic miles of molten rock out of this ground and shot up enough ash to bury all New York City under a mile of the sandy stuff. That's 6,000 times larger than Mount St. Helens. But will it happen here in Yellowstone again? Hessler says since the mega eruptions, the caldera has been filled in by some 80 smaller eruptions that spewed up lava. It's inevitable more will come. We know those are in Yellowstone's future, but the big supervolcanoes, we do not know. Still, most scientists say don't worry about visiting Yellowstone because signs of a coming catastrophic eruption would be clear weeks, maybe even decades or centuries before the big blow. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Yellowstone National Park. Thanks, Paul. Beautiful scenery, but Pat, some pretty frightening scenarios in Paul's report. Oh, I used to work in Yellowstone. I had one summer working there at the Forest Service. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, my, you know, we got, I worked on a filling station actually pumping gas. We pumped about 8,000 gallons a day. We really were busy. It was a line from early morning till night just, you know, coming through. Uh, but uh, when we had a break, we'd go off and we'd swim in those geysers. The Yellowstone Lake is freezing cold, but these little geysers were coming up, so we'd have like a, a warm water swimming pool, and uh, it was great. But I had no idea how bad it is. <clears throat> Here's the deal. They say if it erupted, it's been about 630,000 years since the last one, so it's a long time ago. But if it blew, we'd have about 2,300 cubic miles of stuff thrown into the atmosphere. And as our report showed, it would take the temperature down about eight or nine degrees, destroy agriculture, and it would go all around the world in a cloud of ash. I mean, we're sitting in America on the most dangerous earthquake potential, a volcanic potential in the world. And with the ring of fire heating up, you read about, well, okay, Japan, it had a blow, and you had something in Indonesia, and you got something in, in uh, Ecuador, a bad one, and then you may have some in, in Seattle. But remember, Yellowstone is sitting there in that uh, overall zone of uh, instability as the plates crunching. Mm -hmm. 
we don't want to scare you, but it's fun to know that uh, you better get right with the Lord. And if the thing blows up, hallelujah, we go up to be with Jesus. That, that's the answer. All right, there we go. Well, thankfully, they're able to monitor it to some degree. Well, a lot, a lot of good that's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that, that ad right. that they, they have in our background is, what are you doing? Are you a guard? And, well, I'm, I'm a, uh, a monitor I'm, whether or not a robbery is taking place. And he looks and says, a robbery is taking place. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all you can do is say, well, it's going to be a an explosion. You can't stop it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. News flash, huh? All right. Well, coming up, a new organization that's targeting young voters. People just love it. Using what millennials know and what millennials love to get them engaged. It's so fun to watch. You'll see for yourself when we come back. Half of all today's young people, or so-called millennials, identify or lean toward the Democratic Party, which accounts, among things, for those huge crowds that Bernie Sanders had and announced socialist. But one reason why it's no surprise is because no major organization has been working to reach them with conservative ideas. And all they're hearing in colleges is the left-wing mantra and they don't have a clue, and I mean this literally, they don't have a clue about the history of America, and a lot of them are functionally illiterate. But they're voters, or can be, when they get to be 18 or 20, 21, whatever the rules are. Well, until now, they're, be they're beginning to learn. Heather Sells brings us the story of one man on a mission to deliver a message of conservatism to college campuses. While the grand old party isn't known for reaching the young, there's a conservative youth movement that's alive and growing. As you can see at this recent CPAC conference, timeless principles delivered in millennially savvy ways energize this group by the hundreds. So the things we're trying to do is uh, get out there, you know, be that ground game, be that ground game that Obama was doing in, in, in 2008 and, and, and 2012, and being out there, being active, getting on campuses, hitting, uh, hitting the, the liberals where it hurts. The organization behind this controlled chaos, Turning Point USA. Entrepreneur Charlie Kirk started it four years ago at the ripe young age of 18. Today, he oversees more than 1,000 chapters on college campuses across the country. We met up with Kirk at Ohio State, where he told us the birth of Turning Point came after he discovered that no major conservative organization existed for reaching young people. We're up against unparalleled opposition. We're up against a well-oiled machine that George Soros and the left has pumped in hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 10 years. Turning Point's strategy is laborious but effective. It centers around one-on-one -on -one conversation with college students, many of whom have never been exposed to the intellectual rigor behind conservative principles. It's by no means a, a, a majority of the youth vote is going towards you know, the direction of left, nor do they endorse those ideas wholeheartedly. It's a lot of young people who, for whatever reason, are liberal. They identify themselves as liberal. But what you'll find is most of these people, when you start asking them why they believe certain things, what they really want is less government in their life. Kirk has shrewdly assessed that small government is a winning point for conservatives trying to influence young minds. He's also decided to leave the social issues for his liberal opponents. They come and talk about gay marriage, abortion, and drug legalization. So those are their big issues that they win on. Well, let's talk about corruption in government taxes being too high, and government being too big. Kirk's 2016 plan is all about influencing higher education. He wants to double his field staff to 100 by this summer and start a chapter on every major campus in key voting states, like Florida, Virginia, and Ohio. His strategy includes selling conservative values through nonstop social media and heavy use of pop culture. At Cedarville University, Rep. Carly Conley uses different themes every week to draw students. People just love it, you know, uh, using what millennials know and what millennials love to get them engaged is, it's so fun to watch. But Turning Point is up against powerful forces like the media, Hollywood, and what Kirk considers his chief opponent, academia. The vast majority of them 
will teach leftist dogma as facts, will use their position of influence using grade leveraging through um, ostracizing students, isolating them, making them feel alone, making them feel stupid, not taking their facts or opinions seriously. Election experts and many political leaders agree the youth vote is key to political survival. If you are not always training the next generation, how do you ever pass on the legacy? President Obama captured two-thirds of this group in 2012. Analysts believe Mitt Romney would have won if he had only split that vote with Obama. Kirk says today's young people want a presidential candidate who is authentic, likable, and can relate to their world. So when a candidate, for example, is trying to communicate to a younger audience, and they don't know that just the basic terms of vocabulary, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Kanye West, the Kardashians, Taylor Swift, I mean, that doesn't make you necessarily very likable. Turning Point doesn't campaign for or promote candidates, but its ability to win over young minds to a conservative worldview could affect this election and many more in the years to come. Reporting in Columbus, Ohio, Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, that's a movement that needs tracking. It'll be interesting to see the impact that they're able to have. Up next, a young woman takes a crippling fall and doctors tell her boyfriend tragic news. She'll be paralyzed from the chest down and will never walk again. And hearing those words from a doctor hits you like a load of bricks. Watch as this woman makes a miraculous recovery and hear why she says that her accident has become the biggest blessing in her life. Well, we're having a tremendous week of prayer. Yesterday during our noon chapel, we heard from the pastor of the fourth largest church in America, Robert Morris. We also continued to pray for the request that you, our partners and viewers, have sent in. Take a look. We're asking for every one of these situations all around the world, the requests that we've held, those that express them, those that are calling in right now, those that are logging on to CBN.com. Jesus, we thank you for this appointment and the gift of faith. What I want to get across is God needs you. Okay, but here's my first point. Here's point number one. God doesn't need anything. <laughs> here's point number two. God decided to need you. Now, now, he doesn't need you to exist. He decided to need you to coexist. So here's point number three. Have you decided to need God? And let God show you what your part is and start cooperating with God because God needs you. The messages we're getting are so wonderful. You can join us during our chapel services, streaming live every day this week. All you have to do is log on to CBN.com at noon Eastern time. The Reverend Samuel Rodriguez is our featured speaker today, and you'll also be hearing from him coming up today on the 700 Club. And remember, if you'd like us to pray for you, all you have to do is call 1-800-759-0700 or log on to CBN.com. Give us your prayer request, and we'll be sure to pray for you and send you the special packet that we have for you free of charge. You know what Morris was saying? He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. He really is a delightful person. He's a wonderful speaker, and his church is huge. That Gateway Church in Dallas yes. is huge. But, you know, there's a verse in Job that says, Your heart will yearn for the creature that your hands have made. I was thinking about that. You know, that God Almighty will yearn for the creature that His hands, I mean, He made me, made you, made us all, but He begins to yearn for us. It's amazing. Okay, we'll talk about that later, but right now I want to introduce to you a walking miracle, Liz Mitchell. She's got an amazing answer to prayer. After she broke her neck, doctors told her boyfriend, your girlfriend is never going to walk again. But Liz and the boyfriend refused to believe that word. You know that song, Whose Report Do You Believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Well, they trusted the power of God Almighty. In the fall of 2012, Dallas District Attorney Liz Mitchell was in great shape, both physically and professionally. 
but her quest for perfection came at a price. Inside, I had nothing. I was empty, I was unhappy, and nothing was ever good enough for me. You know, I had the love of family and friends, but I just always was lacking something, but I didn't know what that was. Liz was about to find out. She was entering her second floor apartment one night when her dog rushed out to greet her. Liz lost her balance and fell through the railing, 17 feet to the pavement below. I remember laying on the ground and just kind of closing my eyes and thinking, I'm so sorry. You know, it was more of like an apology to God. Liz was rushed to Baylor University Medical Center. When Brian, her boyfriend, arrived with her family, the doctor told them that she had broken her neck. All doctors ER. I remember his words distinctly. He said, she'll be paralyzed from the chest down and will never walk again. And hearing those words from, from a doctor hits you like a load of bricks. Their relationship of only six months was based on mutual physical attraction and having a good time. But now, with Liz in a medically induced coma, Brian had to decide if there was something more. Seeing her lying in a bed, unable to move, tubes in her mouth, machines beeping in the background, a swollen face, and it just completely stripped that superficial looks that were kind of driving our relationship previously. Over the next several days, Brian's focus shifted to another relationship he had long abandoned. I was raised in the church and I always had a, a relationship with Christ, but I would say that it wasn't a fulfilling one on my end. As soon as the accident happened, everything kind of came back and I just did a complete 180 and it really brought about a huge change in my faith. And I said, the moment that she wakes up, we're gonna go to work and we're going to try to maximize whatever God allows her to get back and, and I'm gonna be her rock alongside with her. When Liz came out of the coma four days later, she also rededicated her life to Jesus. I just all of a sudden found myself in this shell, this body that I thought was so important, and it was completely useless. At that point, my mind just made a shift that I was never going to be in control of my life again, that it was in the hands of God, and whatever was to happen was going to be His will for me. And there was no sadness, there was no resentment, it was peace, a feeling of peace for the first time. As Brian broke the news to Liz of her prognosis, he also made a promise. He was very quick to say, you know, even if you're in a wheelchair, I still love you and we'll have a beautiful life. From that day forward, he was by my side always. Brian and Liz prayed together every night. And what was once a superficial relationship quickly became a spiritual one. It was through those conversations with God that we truly started to build that foundation together. But it was also just during that time that we fell in love, truly in love. But while Brian and Liz's faith was progressing, Liz's recovery seemed to be at a standstill. Every night, Brian would ask me to move my toes. And with all of my might, I would concentrate and use every ounce of energy I had to try to move my toes and still would get nothing. Liz was transferred to Baylor Rehabilitation Center and met with her doctors. I very point blank stated I wanted to walk out of the hospital. I was told at that time I needed to lower my expectations and that I was there because they wanted to teach me how to become independent in a wheelchair. Brian decided to pray and ask God for a miracle. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your team says because we got the ultimate healer on our side and if it's his will, then you're gonna walk. And I just put my hands on the foot of the bed and I just said, Lord, I have nothing right now. We're completely broken and I need some guidance and I need something to make me feel like this is gonna be okay. Like, please give me something. Please give Liz something. He pulled back the sheets and asked me to move my legs. Show me what you just did. This is awesome. I'm moving my legs. <laughs> I'm so proud of you, baby. 
that was the turning point in her recovery. Brian says improvement came every day. The steps and the miracles that we saw unfold with our eyes are something that can't be explained by science. Less than three months after her accident, Liz walked out of the rehab center. A few months later, Liz and Brian got married. But the miracles weren't over yet. On November 16, 2015, Dorothy Marie Mitchell was born by natural childbirth. Brian and Liz chose the name Dorothy because it means God's gift. Considering where Liz started, completely paralyzed from the neck down, and then you see her in a delivery room, pushing her own baby out, holding her baby, and being part of that experience, there's no way that you couldn't believe that that's a miracle. Liz and Brian are grateful for all their blessings, but most of all, they treasure the fact that God's love gave them a second chance at life. We could not be happier. It is such a more fulfilling life that we have today after the accident than we could have ever imagined. What looks like a curse has actually become the biggest blessing in my life because I'm now the person I'm supposed to be. I am the happiest woman you'll probably ever meet. I have the love of the Lord. I have the most beautiful family and just love that I didn't ever think was possible. God's love is absolute and it is all that matters in this world. Whatever that emptiness is in your heart that you're trying to fill with other things, those things don't matter. They're not forever. His love is what's forever, so it's never too late. Love is forever. What a marvelous story. <clears throat> Here's some prayer. I want prayer that my children and grandchildren may accept Jesus, this person writes in. Prayer for a better job, healing of side effects after a stroke, much like what we just <laughs> saw, to be healed of insomnia. What do you have? Well, here's someone saying, I need healing of COPD. Only a portion of my lungs are functioning. Someone else needing emotional healing after being divorced. Healing for a six-year-old boy dealing with severe advancing symptoms of Addison's disease, which is a hormonal disease. Yes. And someone saying, I need deliverance. I feel like my mind is going crazy. Well, God is on the throne. Mm -hmm. He created everything. He made you. He made the circumstances. He controls the light. He controls the darkness. He controls the wealth. He controls everything. So we're going to join hands. Thank and Lord, you. we're going to believe you. Now, Father, Gracious. for all these thousands of requests that come to us from all the world, Lord, we ask now in Jesus' name mm -hmm. that you might reach out and do a miracle. We pray for healing. We pray for peace. We pray for deliverance. We pray for blessing. Mm -hmm. Terry, do you have anything? There's someone you've been given a, um, a, sort of a moderate diagnosis of pancreatic problems, but God is healing that condition for you right now. Just receive it. Yeah. You're made whole and you'll not have trouble anymore. Uh, the, there's a lady I've heard that has stage four cancer several months to live. God Almighty is in charge of cancer, and we speak the word against cancer. We speak against wasting cancer. Mm -hmm. We speak that the immune system will turn on and kill the cancer, mm -hmm. and that there might be healing in the name of Jesus. Terry. And someone else, you have a collapsed <coughs> lung, and the strangeness about your condition is it won't stay inflated. But God is turning that around right now as you'll be able to breathe cleanly and wholly and you won't have any more trouble. A God, sin revival. Thank you. Sin Jesus. revival to this nation. Sin revival, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Well, give us a call wherever you are. We'd love to hear from you. We want your prayer request. If you haven't sent them in, do so. <laughs> and we're here for you. So call right mm -hmm. now. Well, still ahead, America's most influential Latino evangelical leader. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We are people of the word. We are salt and light. Reverend Samuel Rodriguez joins us live. That's just ahead.
and welcome back to the 700 Club. Can members of the military display Bible verses in the workplace? That's the question before the military's highest court. The case revolves around Marine Lance Corporal Monifa Sterling. She was demoted, court-martialed, and dishonorably discharged after re refusing to remove a Bible verse she posted at her desk in 2013. Her attorneys have appealed. They argue that it was a violation of her religious freedom. Her legal team calls this a landmark case that could set a precedent for military men and women for decades. The scripture, by the way, posted on Sterling's computer and desk was from Isaiah chapter 54, which reads, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. A Christian student group is being told they need a permit before they can talk about Jesus on the campus of North Carolina State University. So they filed a lawsuit over the university's policy on student speech. Grace Christian Life says they shouldn't have to get a permit to hand out flyers and talk to students about Jesus. The Raleigh News and Observer reports that the group also says students from other organizations have been able to hand out literature and talk to students without a permit. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. As Christians, we know we're supposed to be salt and light in our troubled world. But practically, how do we do that? Well, that's the subject of a new book by a man who is the president of the National Hispanic Leadership Conference, an international organization of more than 500,000 evangelical churches. Take a look. Reverend Samuel Rodriguez has been called the leader of the Latino evangelical movement. He describes himself as a blend of Billy Graham, and Martin Luther King Jr. with salsa on top. He's also the pastor of New Seasons Christian Worship Center in Sacramento. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We are people of the word. We are salt and light. In his book, Be Light, Reverend Rodriguez uses the analogy of spiritual light to deliver a message of hope for a darkened world. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Your book is so timely. I, you know, we live in an age that I think almost daily you hear someone lamenting the darkness, if you will, of the time that we live in. But you say that when the darker things get, the brighter the light. Indeed. Some have argued that we live in the darkest hour. But, I mean, what are we going to do with this energy? Are we going to spend our time whining about the darkness, complaining, critiquing, cursing the darkness? Why not allocate all of our energy, the mandate of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. Instead of cursing the darkness and whining about the darkness, why not turn on the light? Mm -hmm. So this book is a clarion call. Don't yeah. drink the Kool-Aid. I yeah. get we're living in dark <laughs> times, but there's light inside of us through the reality and the vicarious atoning work of Jesus Christ. And that there's even a mandate for us in this hour. In some ways, we could say we're living in the most exciting time because of the opportunities. I'm an optimist. I believe we're at the precipice of a great awakening. There are things that guide me to be light every day. And it's a principle, it's, I call it the prophetic rubric. One, today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Yeah. Second, you are what you tolerate. Third, there is no such animal as comfortable Christianity. Number four, we should never sacrifice truth on the altar of political expediency. Yes. And number five, and I, I, I adhere to the prayer of John in the book of Revelation, come Lord Jesus come. But while the church is waiting for Jesus to come down, Jesus is waiting for his church to stand up. Yeah. So this is the quintessential hour mm -hmm. to be light in the midst of darkness. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. You talk in the book about some of the unique properties of light and actually compare them or use them to show us some of the things that we can be and should be. Yeah, everything from the principle, all the rules, refraction, reflection, the albedo, bioluminescent. I discuss the component of we emit what we absorb. Mm -hmm. We emit, we can only emit what we absorb. What are we absorbing? 
if we are absorbing toxic relationships and ideas and constructs and, and an atmosphere that is not conducive to righteous living, we're going to emit that. So it, it behooves us to clear up and detox our atmosphere, our relationships, our language. Uh, who is speaking into us? Surround your life, not with people that speak about you, but people that speak into you. Yes. And, and it's, it's that sort of clarion call. And even the refraction, when, when light hits an object, it bends. Mm -hmm. So whatever obstacle has come your way in your family, your home, your marriage, your health, your finances, when the light of Christ is in you, it is never the end of the light. It may, it will bend, but at the end of the day, that light will reach its purpose in the name of Jesus. Well, Sammy, you say also that because of the call on our lives at this time as believers, that we need to self-examine. I, I wonder, as I listen to you talk about some of the things out there in the world that are challenging, if we're dancing with the devil a little bit, but calling ourselves followers of Christ. Yeah, we, see, there's light and there's darkness, mm -hmm. and two objects cannot occupy the same space. Yeah. We, the prophetic and the pathetic cannot occupy the same space. Yeah. So we really, by turning on the light, it's a repudiation of darkness. With truth and love, but it's turning on the light. We can't compromise. We can't permit dark areas. We can't sell out the light for the purpose of pleasing the greater culture. The culture does not define me. One of the big, th the, the stemming out of Matthew chapter 5 is that you are the light of the world. There's definition coming from Christ. You are the light of the world. So what defines us? Are we defined by culture, politics, moral relativism? Are we defined by this generation's sort of worldview? We're defined by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we can never compromise truth on the altar of expediency. So in that last story, you heard the couple of the woman who had this tragic accident yes. talk about the fact that they had had this kind of passive relationship with Christ before and then tragedy hit and ba-boom, they came back to the truth of, of the rock they stood on. You know, on occasion, it takes great darkness. It, this is going to sound a bit crude, but it takes prosecution, the persecution of our Christian worldview via legislative powers and authorities. It takes these sort of moments to wake up the church. Yeah. That's why I do believe we do live in the darkest hour, but it is the greatest hour to be light. Only if we let go of comfortable Christianity, yeah. only if we let go of the spirit of complacency, only if we push back on the spirit of Jezebel and Ahab and act like an Elijah and Elisha and function with the mantle of fire and light for the glory of Christ. Yeah, we have to understand what we're called to. So where do you begin that process? If you feel like maybe you've given yourself over to some things you shouldn't have, or that maybe you're just passive enough that you're not filled with that enthusiasm that we should be filled with to accomplish what God said to us, where do we start? Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It, understand that Christ defines you. You're not even defined by yeah. what you do for God. You're defined by what God already did for you. But Christ defines you. You're not defined by your failures. You're defined by his forgiveness. Yeah. And it's embracing that fact that Jesus Christ makes you light because he is the light. And the moment you embrace that reality, you are free to push mm -hmm. back darkness. Again, we channel so much energy in complaining about the things around yeah. us, the darkness in our lives, in our thoughts, in our families, with our children. There is greater power in turning on the light. And that's through the faith and the faith and the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It works. Every time yeah. light it's turned on, darkness flees. Yes. I mean, <laughs> test it. It really it is works. what it is. You know, you, your book is a clarion call to all of us as believers to self-examine, come home to the heart of God, and then reflect the light in us out to the world around us. It is such a good book. It's called Be Light. It's so timely for the day that we live in. It's available wherever books are sold. You'll know it because Reverend Rodriguez is this guy on the cover. He's also our guest speaker today during our week of prayer chapel and you are in for a treat. So please join us for that live streaming event by logging on to CBN.com. That's at noon Eastern time. You always bring a wonderful word. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. So Thank you so to much. Have you here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, coming up, we've got your email questions. Deb asks, is it too late after you die to confess Jesus as your Savior to his face? We'll hear what Pat has to say about that when we bring it on. Time to bring it on with some of the email questions that you've sent in. And Pat, this first one comes from Deb, who says, is it too late after you die to confess Jesus as your Savior to his face? I'm worried about someone who says they just don't know if he's real or not. Well, the Bible says it is appointed in a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. 
I hate to tell you, but after you die, it's all over. So you've got this life, you've got 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 20 years, whatever you got. During that time, you've got plenty of time to say yes to Jesus. And if you don't take it afterwards, you're looking at judgment. All right. Okay, this is Reba who says, is it appropriate to address Satan or the devil in the course of prayers? For those of us that do so, is it not disrespectful to God since prayer is communication and communion with him? Isn't it wrong to take time to address Satan in the course of such a serious time with God? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, people make things so complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with a demon <clears throat> and you say to that demon, get out. Well, that's not a prayer, that's an order, you yes, know. Exactly. You're not begging him to get mm -hmm. out. In the name of Jesus, be gone. I, and I think the prayer, I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil, mm -hmm. that is not a prayer, that is a command. Like, come out, mm -hmm. command, all right? Okay, this is Judy who says, I just found out the leadership in my church believes that God has selected or called some to be saved, some not. One even said he believes there are Christians walking around who don't know they've been selected or saved yet, but that they are still Christians. I don't get this. I thought Jesus came for all. If he only selects some, what would be the use of preaching the gospel? Well, <clears throat> you've I've touched on one of the fights that's been going on in the church <laughs> forever. That, that's extreme... Calvinism, and you've got Calvinism versus Arminianism. Arminianism was more loosey-goosey, and uh, Calvinism was very strict. But I think extreme Calvinism is in error. It's not true. God wants everybody to be saved and all to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. That's what he says, and therefore we, we, we're here to proclaim the gospel. If you have a bound will and you can't accept the Lord except through his grace, then Oh, we're in error, and I think that's an error. So you belong to a church that's extreme Calvinist. If you don't like it, leave. <laughs> well, that's all the time we've got. We leave you with today's Power Minute from James 5. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.